All right, so first of all, um, we're going to take a look at uh, just exactly what we mean by extrema before we can talk about this. So let's start by sketching this graph. So if you have your graphing calculator, that would be a handy thing to uh, put in. Uh, for those of you that are watching on the board, I will try to get the uh, draw the graph for you. Uh, well, not me, but I'll try to get the uh, computer to do it for you. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so the uh, equation that we're looking at is uh, y equals x cubed minus 3x squared. So that's roughly the graph. Um, make that a little bit better for you. Um, Yeah, it's a little thicker, but um, what we mean by extrema here anyways is that um, we're interested in these points over here. So we're looking at these peaks and valleys, and we're going to come up with a way to talk about those peaks and valleys today. So um, when we refer to extrema, I'll give you the precise definition in just a second. Um, that's what you want to be thinking about at this moment is those peaks and valleys. So it's going to, we transfer, it's going to look something like, it was something like this, and we'll just label those as our extrema here and here. And of course, for some reason, the computer decided not to draw any x-axis, but I'll do that for it. So when we talk about uh, extrema, the precise definition for extrema says there's some interval where it's a minimum or maximum. So for example, um, you might be looking at this point that I've arrowed right here, and you might say, well, how is that extreme when there's this point here, which is clearly larger? To be uh, an extreme value or extrema, all we need for that is some interval. So for example, let me highlight one for you here. Um, perhaps from there to there, here's the function this is the largest value along that range. So as long as there's some interval where it, it is a minimum or maximum, we call that extrema. Okay. So now we have to think a little bit about this. Um, so where, I mean, I think I've, well, almost drawn it. Let me just try this, uh, I'll fix this up a little bit. <laughs> just so we can get a, it actually goes like this. A little lower there. So it actually goes about like um, that. That'd be a little more accurate. But um, t so where are the critical points then, these extrema? Where would you locate them? Like what's the coordinates we're talking about? Yeah, so at um, 2, negative 4, that was one of them. And the other point is 0, 0. So here's what uh, our strategy is going to become then, is that we want to think about this as far as how could we use uh, the tangent line or a derivative to find it. So what do you notice when you think of these extreme peaks and valleys? Anybody notice anything about their tangent? Yeah, they're horizontal. So if I put this in, here's the tangent line at 0, here's the tangent line at 2. So if you kind of think in your head, if it's a bump, like a peak or a valley, then in order to make that happen, there has to be somewhere where that derivative went flat, right? In order to stand right on top of the bump or right at the bottom of the valley. So um, let's verify it. If we were to take the derivative of this, it would be 3x squared minus 6x. Uh, so if we wanted to verify it, let's try f prime at 2. So that'll be um, 3 times 9 minus 6 times 3. Um, sorry, 6 times 2. Uh, and of course, it's still early. That should be 4 <laughs> minus 6 times 2. So there, that makes more sense. That equals to 0. And if we 
we verify again at f prime of 0, if you stick in 0 into any of these parts here, you're just going to end up with a 0. So it is the case that that derivative is 0 at the extrema. Now, can anyone, so when you think extrema right now in your head, you're thinking that there is a peak or a valley. Can anybody think of um, how could we get a peak or valley if we didn't have a flat or horizontal derivative? There's, there's more places we may need to look other than just when the derivative is horizontal. Anybody think of where we might have to look? You still should be thinking peak and valley, though. That still is true. Peak or valley. Pardon me? Vertical, vertical tangents. You're very close to the right idea. Very close to the right idea. So let's elaborate. What do you know about a vertical tangent? Tell me something about it. What's that? It's undefined. Okay, that's the right track. That is the other answer we were looking for. So why will we have to look where the derivative is undefined? Think about those, those sort of things that happen when a derivative is undefined. Um, I, I mean picture. Think of the picture. Can anybody think of a peak or valley that happens when the derivative is undefined? Negative absolute value. Um, yes, absolute value is a good example. Um, but can we be more specific? So if I put the absolute value graph on here, maybe you'll think of why it is that we want to look for where it's undefined. Where is it undefined at the absolute value? At the point. Which point? Oh, at the, at the, yeah, at the 0, 0, right? There's no derivative right here. No derivative there, undefined. So what is that? Remember what we called it? Is it just still two? Is it, it's not quite nine o'clock yet. Perhaps I won't. I won't bug you so much till then. Um, it's a, a corner or a cusp, right? This is a corner or the cusp that we're looking for. So we could have another graph, right, where maybe it's a piecewise one. Maybe it goes as a parabola and then a line. But the par the the point is, if the derivative doesn't exist there, we may have a peak or a valley. So um, that's what we're going to call a critical number now. So a critical number is one at which the derivative is either undefined or equal to 0. So in this, um, in this example that we found up here, the critical numbers in the example above there's nowhere that the derivative is undefined, but the critical numbers would be when x equals 0 or 2. Those were the ones that made the derivative equal to 0, but there was nowhere it was undefined. So the uh, textbook is theorem 3.2. This is known as the extreme value theorem. So if you want to refer to it, of course, being mathematicians, we're all lazy. We'd like to abbreviate it, so EVT is fine. But extreme value theorem is uh, basically what we're going to do is take what we've learned here, and I won't, I won't prove it for this won't be your proof of the day anyways, but uh, um, extreme value theorem then states that um, the extreme values on any interval, so if we have... Oh, So let me show you what I mean here. I'm going to go back up to this original graph. Um, if we look at the red graphs, I'm going to erase some of these, some of these things here. So if we look at the red graph, if we wanted to know where the extreme values were, the biggest and the smallest, if we didn't have a method and we didn't have a graphing calculator, we would need to be able to look at all possible values in here. Now that's not often practical to be able to look at every possible value. But if you'll notice, the ones that are of concern um, are here at the end points and at the 
critical numbers. So what the extreme value theorem does is it guarantees that we don't need to search any further than critical points and endpoints. Okay, so that's what we're going to try using here for the next few examples. So, I mean, uh, just to give you an idea where this can be used and where we'd be headed with it is, I mean, maybe this is a model for profit and loss in your business. Obviously, you want to try and maximize your profits or minimize your losses. So, we'd be interested in figuring out, you know, based on our model, where do we figure we'll make the most money, right? In a business, though, we often don't have the time or we don't want to be just throwing wild ideas out there because that costs money. Um, we'd like to have some direction that we're headed. So if this was the model that we were using, then we would be trying to aim for one of these places here. Like maybe this is the spot that we're interested in um, or this one here. But uh, the, maybe the reason why we're not going to this one is maybe this requires our employees to work 28 hours a day, right? Something that's not possible. So maybe it's not included in our model. Or something that would alienate customers. Or something, yeah. Something that we maybe say that's not desirable. We're going to have to stick within another set of um, another set of constraints. Okay, so this time we're going to try and just, we're just not thinking really about the applications yet. We just want to find the extrema for this polynomial. So I'm going to go through it with you. Um, so the extreme value theorem says I need to check the endpoints. So I'm going to need to check at negative 1 and 2. I also need to find my critical points. So to find my critical points, critical points need a derivative. So f prime of x is 12x cubed minus 12x squared. And it's going to be easier to talk about this if I factor it. So that means I have two new numbers here. I have x equals 0 and I have x equals 1. So there are infinitely many places that we would need to look on this uh, function up here. Now I've narrowed it down to just four. So that's the advantage of using extreme value theorem. So let's find out which ones are the extrema. If we look at this interval, um, that means I'm going to need to calculate f of negative 1, f of 2, f of 0, and f of 1. So let's see here. I should be able to do this with a calculator. At negative 1, it's going to be 3 plus 4. So that should be 7. At, uh, well, I'm going to do the easy one. At 0, it should be 0. At 1, it should be 3 minus 4, which is negative 1. And at 2, oh, OK. Well, this is going to be tough. That'll be 48 minus 32. So that's 16. I hope. Okay. So that means without having to look at the graph, I can tell you here that on that, that interval, this is the maximum and this is the minimum. So I'm going to bring up the graph for you just to verify that it did what we uh, expected. So my range is from negative 1 to 2. And it looks like I'll need values from about negative 2 to 16, or negative 1. So if I put in y equals 4x cubed minus, sorry, it's 3x to the 4. OK, so you can see by the picture that over here, at, um, there is a minimum there at 1. On that picture, just like we predicted, that minimum is still here. Um, and again, if we look for the largest value in this picture, it's up at the top here. And that's what we predicted, is at 2 there would be a maximum. Okay. So your turn. See if you can find all the critical numbers and tell me what the, the extrema are on the interval from negative 1 to 3. So I'm going to try to catch up. I realize that some of you are still working. That's fine. Um, so this would be, let's see here, I'm going to have a derivative of 2 minus 2x to the negative 1 third. And that means the points that I'm going to be looking at, I need to look at the endpoints, so negative 1 and 3. And I also need to look at my critical points. 
So where does 0 equal to 2 minus 2x two to the negative 1 third? And uh, let's see, that means 2x to the negative 1 third equals 2. So x to the negative 1 third equals 1. So that gives me another critical point at x equals to 1. Am I missing any critical points? Refresh my memory again. We've just talked about it, but what is a critical point? Yeah, derivative equals 0. Is that all? Sorry? Also where it's undefined. Are there any problems with this derivative? Could anything go wrong? What if I was to rewrite this as the derivative is 2 minus 2 over cube root of x? That's a terrible x. Let me try that again. Now is there anywhere that there's something could go wrong in the derivative? Yeah, if, we, if x equals to 0, there's going to be a problem here. It's going to be undefined. So there's also another critical point at x equals to 0. Okay. So from this, I get critical points, which are um, x equals to 0 and 1. So now, from that information, I'm going to have to go into the calculator and figure out what they are. Um, what I recommend is that you use your table method if you're doing this in the calculator. Um, I know this has a decimal answer, so it would be like a calculator-style question. So I would go in your TI and put in um, y1 equals 2x minus 3x to the 2 thirds. And then I would go to the table. So I believe that's um, above, the, above the window. No, above the graph. So your button would be go to graph. And it's table that we want. Because then you can enter in the values for x directly so that I can tell you what the values of the function are at these points, and I don't have to do all of them by hand. Okay, so all will do the easy one. There. <laughs> um, can somebody give me another uh, value since I don't have a calculator in front of me? Pretty please? Yeah, Connor? Negative 5, thank you. Okay, how about, um, I think 1 I could do without a calculator. What's 1? Negative 1. Okay, and the last one, what's 3? The value of 3. Negative 0.240. Negative 0.240, yeah, this is a decimal, so negative 0.240. So if I look at my choices here, this says my minimum happens at negative 1, and my maximum happens at 0. So again, let's verify that in the picture and see that it makes sense that those critical points are where they are. Um, sorry, and I need to change my range a little bit here. So it's from negative 1 to 3. And I probably need to, maybe this will be a good range. Okay, so there's a picture of the graph. Um, there's that corner that we were talking about where the derivative is undefined. And if you look at it, that corner also coincides with where we have a maximum. That's the largest value on my picture. This one doesn't quite get up as high. So um, my maximum is at zero, where we were predicting. And my minimum, that's the smallest value down here. So at negative five, as I predict, sorry, at negative one, the uh, minimum's there as we predicted. All right, so um, do people need a minute to copy some of this down, or can I move it? Any objections to moving? Excellent. Okay. Okay, so the last one I'm going to have you try here um, before we do a little application is um, f of x is 2 sine cos 2x. And I've given you a little hint to help you solve it, but um, I'll let you go to it and see what you come up with. I would again use the table method here when you're looking for your values. Let's take a look and see how we did here. Um, so again, can't forget, I got two critical, well, two points there that I need to check, uh, the endpoints. And if I take the derivative, f prime of x is going to be 2 
cosine of x, take away the negative sine of 2x times 2. So I'm going to do a little bit of rearranging here. 2 cos x minus, after that will be plus 4 sine, sorry, that will be a plus 2. Plus 2 sine 2x. And I can rewrite, let's see here, take that out. Cos x plus sine 2x. And I'll use the identity now to try and help solve this. So cos x plus 2 sine x cos x. I can now factor the cosine out as well. So 2 cos x, 1 plus 2 sine x. Which means I'm, uh, I'm going to be solving a couple of trig equations. One of which is where does cos x equal to 0? So one place you might look for it is like this. That happens at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Um, the other one is where, um, for this equation, this will be where it is sine of x equal negative 1 half. So the triangle that I'll be using to solve that, there's 1 root 3, 2. And the angle that I'm going to be working with is this one, 30, opposite over hypotenuse. So 30, that's pi over 6. Remember in calculus, 100% of the time we work in radians. So um, pi over 6 is my reference. And since this is negative, it's going to be in these two quadrants. So in these two quadrants, I would find this would be 7 pi over 6. And I would find this would be 11 pi over 6. And of course, there are many, many answers to this problem, but the ones I'm interested in are in that range of 0 to 2 pi. So if that range were to move, then that would also move my answers around, right? So uh, anyways, nice and friendly like you're used to is 0 to 2 pi. Um, if these are my critical points, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, and then the end points here. So let's uh, take a little inventory. So we're going to have to do f of 0 f of 2 pi, f of pi over 2, f of 3 pi over 2, f of 7 pi over 6, and f of 11 pi over 6. Okay, so again, this is why I recommend you use the table in your graphing calculator. You can get all those answers in one shot without having to do it by hand. Has anybody punched these all into a table? Okay, so... Um, let me just pause this for a okay. okay, so Colin, you look like you're working speedversely hard there. What would the value at zero be? Sorry, negative one? Okay. Um, negative one. And let's see here. Alex, you got one for two pi? Negative one, okay. At pi over two, um, let's see here. EJ, you got one? And let's see here. Moses, you got one for 3 pi over 2? Oh, you don't have your calculator. Okay, uh, fair enough. Helen, can you help us out? Sorry? Okay, who has 3 pi over 2? Sure, Lily. 1? Negative 1. Okay, uh, 7 pi over 6. All right, Ming? Negative 1.5, and what about um, 11 pi over 6? Um, sure, say Negative 1.5. Same thing, negative 1.5. Okay, so again, we can see here that I have a maximum at pi over 2, and I have two choices for a minimum, which is negative 1.5. So the last thing I want to do here is just to go over... Uh, you know, hopefully now you kind of can picture that you're finding these peaks and valleys in the graph. Let's actually try doing an application. Now, first thing I will tell you here is this application um, is known as optimization. There is a section that we'll talk about this. We'll probably spend two days on it near the end of the chapter. But um, I'll just introduce it to you. And today I'm hoping you follow along with me. It's, it's, it's you know, it's, if anything, it's a little bit algebraically uh, 
uh, cha challenging, but the calculus part of it, not so much. So similar to your textbook, let's say. Okay, so here's your scenario. Um, you're drilling, well, I guess this isn't a very good scenario nowadays, but you're drilling for oil um, offshore, meaning somewhere in the ocean, and the rig that you have is, you found the oil is 12 miles from shore, okay? So just like you can see here, it's 12 miles offshore. Now the problem is, uh, the refinery where you send your oil to to sell it, um, it's 20 miles down the coast from where your rig is. Okay. So this is uh, pretty typical in that you don't, all, you don't build a refinery for every rig that you put out there. They're totally different businesses usually. But anyways, um, obviously if we're working underwater, we would expect that it's going to be more expensive underwater than it will be over the ground to build a pipeline, right? You have specialty equipment, uh, you're going to need specially trained people to work underwater. So it says it's 500,000 per mile to do it in the ocean and 300,000 along the coastline. So you might have a couple of strategies. You might say, okay, well, if it costs the most to do it underwater, let's do the least amount underwater. This is the least amount I could do underwater, which means it forces me to use all 20 miles of coastline to do this uh, uh, along the ground. So that's one thing you may think is a you know, suitable solution. You may say, well, this, this scenario number one, that's no good because it's the most amount of space, right? You use the most amount of pipeline. So what if we tried to use a straight line, use the least amount of pipe? The, it would go completely underwater, but in scenario two, we use the least amount of pipe, okay? But we're talking the most expensive, you know, underwater way to do it. So the question then becomes is, well, is there somewhere in between the two extremes that would be optimal for us to build this pipeline? So that's scenario number three, which we're gonna work out together, is partially, along the uh, water and then partially along the coastline, not completely. Okay. So I'm going to fill this in with you. Um, the picture has been labeled well, I probably would choose the same things. Um, our cost, I'm going to do this in hundreds of thousands of dollars so that we don't have to add all those zeros. So if you think about the way our cost is going to work, is the cost is going to be equal to three times uh, the amount that we go along, I don't know, let's call it the ground, plus um, five times the amount that we go along the water, right? 300,000 times the ground and 500,000 times the water. So the, the third picture here will give us an idea of how we're going to set this equation up. Um, if I was to land here, and this distance is y, if that's the distance y, then 20 minus y is what's left over. That's how much I didn't use. Now the reason that's important is between that and the 12 miles, I can figure out how much I went underwater. So that's going to be equal to the square root of 12 squared plus 20 minus y all squared. So this will be... Um, Square root 144 plus 400 minus 40y plus y. Whoops, running out of space here. That's awful. I'll just <laughs> I'll move it to another spot here. So um, that distance along the water. The cost will be three times. As the picture shows, the distance along the ground, which is y, plus 5 times the square root. So this will be 144, um, 400. something like this. Okay. So I'll just give you a minute if you're
So there's the derivative. Um, we probably wouldn't want to write it out that way. Let's, let's try and tidy the derivative up a little bit. So the derivative, um, it's going to be 3 plus 5 halves times um, 2y minus 40 over the square root of y squared minus 40y plus 544. Four. Okay, so that's the derivative that we're going to have to work with here. And uh, I guess we can factor out a little bit there. We could take a 2 out of the top and bottom. That's the same thing as 3 plus 5 um, times y minus 20 over uh, y squared minus 40y plus 544. Okay, so if I uh, try to find a critical number here, then um, what I'm going to have to do is, um, if you remember how to solve radical equations, usually what you want to be able to do is square both sides of the equation. So I'm going to move the 3 to the other side. That way I won't have to foil. So I'll have um, negative 3 is 5 times y minus 20 over square root of y squared minus 40y plus 544. Four. And if I square both sides, that means I get uh, 9 equals 25, y minus 20 all squared, um, divided by y squared minus 40y plus 544. And now we can do some like cross multiplying. I'm going to give you a minute or two just to work this out and see what you get when you factor it. Again, you may want to get to the point where you could factor it. You may want to use your graphing calculator to help you, though. All right, so I'm going to... Actually, let's... Be 9y squared minus 360y. Uh, oh, 4... Here. I'm going to have minus 40y, which is uh, times 25, so that's 1,000. Is that is it 1,000 y? And it'll be 400, so then I guess it'd be plus 10,000. So if I collected my like terms, um, I believe I'll get 16y squared. Um, oh, and, and that should be a negative. Um, so I'll have 640 left. And let's see here, that'll be 5, well that'd be 1, 2, 4, is that right? No, 5024, I think. 5104. Okay. Um, and I can do a little factoring on this. So 16y squared. And let's see here. So 640. If I divide that by 16, it's 40. And 5104 five, divided by 16 is 319. Okay. So this was the point where I suggested uh, factoring that one. I think one of them is 11. Is that right? Is 319? 29. 29, 11. I mean, everybody knows that 29 plus 11 is 40, and 29 times 11 is 319, right? 
Anyways, I would, I would expect you to have a graphing calculator if the numbers were that large. But 16y minus 11 and y minus 29. That gives me my critical numbers, y equals 11 or 29. But in this problem, if you remember what y is, that distance for y up here can be at most 20 miles. So I have to reject 29 because that would mean I went past the oil refinery. So 11 is the, uh, the value I'm going to use. So let's take a look at our three scenarios here. So in the first scenario, the cost is going to be three times the ground, which is uh, 20 miles, plus 12 times five, which is the cost along the water. So that's uh, 120, so it'd be $12 million. Um, in scenario two, that's 544 square root. And we're going to times it, it's all underwater, times it by five. So that'll be um, $116.62. And the scenario that we came up with, um, this, this link over here for Y is 11. So that means there's going to be uh, nine left over. And I believe if we use Pythagoras, that means the length here is 15, that it goes underwater. So the cost is going to be um, 5 times 15, which is underwater, plus 3 times 11, which is on the ground. So 75 and 33 is 108. So it will cost 10.8 million. That's the best, and the we cannot get any cheaper than that, would be to land 11 miles in from the coast, or sorry, from the rig. Okay. Now, um, just to double check here, there's one thing which I sort of neglected to talk about is what if we divided by zero? And the quickest way to ask yourself, could we divide by zero, is to go like this, and we'll use the discriminant from math 11. So b squared minus 4ac, um, this one is going to be greater, sorry, less than zero, which if you remember what it means when it's less than zero, that means there's no solution. So there will be no um, places where I divide by zero. So anyways, we wouldn't need to check uh, for any undefined points. That derivative is defined everywhere. Um, and I mean, this is fictitious, but you deserve a pretty good bonus. You just saved your employer $1.2 million, or possibly $1.2 million, uh, depending on which scenario they used, right? But uh, anyway, this represents optimization stuff. This is about as, you know, as tough as an optimization question gets, but it, just to give you an idea where Extrema is actually used in the real world. Okay, um, so for homework tonight, um, you have the rest of the block. It's page 203, numbers 11 to 33 and odds only.